Science Night Live for uh, the spring semester, uh, Earth Day edition. Uh, Hofstra has been celebrating Earth Day today with a whole bunch of events on campus. Um, we, are, we are very fortunate to be uh, finishing off the day with uh, Enrico Nardone, our speaker. Uh, Rico is the executive director at SeaTuck Environmental Association, uh, headquartered in Islip, New York. Uh, I first met Rico many years ago when uh, he asked me to be the, the lead-off speaker for a novice naturalist lecture series. And um, I, I consider that probably the single most important lecture I've ever given. Uh, because it introduced me to, uh, to Rico and the people at SeaTuck. Uh, a really remarkable group of naturalists and, and dedicated environmentalists, um, all, uh, you know, just doing amazing work uh, all across Long Island, um, and that's, uh, that's what Rico's gonna be talking about tonight. I also wanna mention, and I think he's gonna talk about it a little bit too, um, I've been involved for six years now, I think, uh, with a uh, summer uh, workshop uh, training teachers in uh, natural history. Um, it's, uh, it's uh, 10 years, it's really? 11 years. 11 years, okay. Shows you what I, time flies, yeah. Um, and, and this is, this, this is uh, hosted by the uh, Green Tree Foundation up in Manhasset, but um, it's CTUC that, that, and that working with Hofstra and Adelphi University that, that put it together. And um, it's, it's been an amazing experience for me. I think it's an amazing experience for the teachers who are part of it. Uh, it's a, it's a week-long workshop, uh, one week for elementary school teachers and one week for, for secondary school teachers in the summertime up at the Green Tree property in Manhasset, and then a whole series of field trips uh, throughout the year, uh, including uh, an astronomy night, which uh, we host uh, here at Hofstra. Um, and, you know, I try and go on as many of these field trips as possible because they're all over Long Island and they really highlight the important work that SeaTuck is doing across Long Island. And I'm always just completely fascinated, uh, educated and humbled by the expertise and dedication of, of Rico and his team at, at SeaTuck. And, and really, thanks to them, Long Island is actually getting better uh, than it's ever been, it's, uh, for, than it's been for a long time. Uh, more biodiverse, more ecologically sound, more sustainable, and uh, I'll let you hear about all of this from the man himself. Pass the microphone. I'm going to stand. You're going to stand. You're gonna stand okay. You can hear me okay with this? Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Brett. Hi, everybody. Happy Earth Week. We had a nice celebration today. Uh, it's nice to be here. I'm excited to share some of the work we're doing. Um, if you don't know, SeaTuck is a nonprofit organization. We're, we're based in Isla, but we work across the island to conserve Long Island wildlife. We um, advocate and fight for wildlife every day. We conduct conservation projects around the island. We engage community scientists. I'll talk a, a bit about that today in helping to better understand Long Island wildlife populations. And we offer a robust environmental education program. Um, I wasn't, I'm not gonna touch on the education side, except I was gonna highlight teacher workshop because this is we have our applications are open now uh, I won't say much more other than if, if you um, if you know a teacher that's interested in engaging their students in the natural world uh, that's the website to send them to and uh, it, it's a great program so I'm going to talk mostly about our, our conservation work and the I'm, I'm really the, the spokesperson for this team colleagues at SeaTuck, Maureen, uh, Mike, Ariel, Emily, and John, um, doing just awesome, awesome work. I'm proud to work with them and, and um, lucky to be their cheerleader and, and um, spokesperson. So I pitched this um, talk with the idea that there's a, there's a, you know, sort of a, lots of bad news about wildlife coming out recently over the past couple of years and that Long Island is sort of paradoxically having new species arrive and, and return on, uh, to our, our island. Um, but this is, these are some of the headlines. There was a big World Wildlife uh, Foundation study that showed that um, overall wildlife populations were down 70% since 1970. 
was it was criticized a little bit and then it was kind of defended a lot uh, even if they were half even if they were half right it's still you know staggering numbers so um, but on Long Island as I mentioned there's this odd thing happening with some recovery um, some returning species and a new species arriving for the first time um, I'm gonna fill out the other side of the ledger later in the talk and that's not all rosy but there's some interesting stories to tell. So we'll jump in. I, I was gonna, I'll go, I have a lot to cover. I don't, I'll stop if it gets too long because I really wanna get to some discussion and questions. So I'll, uh, I'll start, I'll, I'll, I'll go quickly. I think you should feel free to stop me if you have something you wanna ask, that, that's fine with me. Um, so first, uh, river otters. Uh, these are in the, the returning category, coming back to Long Island. So these are not the, sort of hanging around eating oysters on their backs uh, that you see out in Monterey Bay in California places like that um, but they're just as cute these are river otters uh, they don't lay around on their backs they're very active these are the you've seen videos of them they're very playful um, always moving around uh, eating lots of fish and um, they were really all over the East Coast and, and most of North, most North American rivers at one time, but really wiped out by the fur trade. Um, my colleague Mike refers to their pelt as the gold standard. They're really dense fur, um, but not too thick because they were so active, they had to move around a lot, so they couldn't carry a lot of weight, but it was dense because they had to be in the water a lot. Um, and uh, they were hit hard. I mean, Long Island is one of the places where they were wiped out pretty early. So by the early 1800s, they were gone. And gone not just from Long Island, but you know, most of New York, most of New England, I think extirpated essentially from 11 states before people started catching on and trying to restrict the pelt harvest and the trapping. Um, so in New York, they were basically gone except for a small patch in the middle of the Adirondacks that then after they put restrictions in place in the 1900s, they just, you know, they just sort of naturally started expanding, moving down, back down the Hudson over time. There, were, there was, they didn't move some otters uh, west in, in western New York, but all the southern expansion was natural, and they've just been getting closer and closer to Long Island, and they've sort of found their way here. Um, nobody's quite sure exactly when the first ones came. There's, you know, they came, it seems, in two places, one from across. Connecticut and Westchester, but also from the archipelago of islands off the North Shore, um, Plum Island, uh, fi um, uh, Fisher's Island, that's Fisher's Island, and they came that way. Um, so my colleague Mike Bottini did this study of latrine sites in 2008, and he found these two clusters, one on the North Shore in Nassau and one out on the Conix that sort of support this theory. This cluster on the, in the North Shore, he thinks, was three or four individuals. The, the one of the Peconics was one. There was one otter out there. And they just, they have these tremendous ranges. They can cover 10 or 12 miles of coastland. And they're in and out of rivers all the time, just constantly on the go and covering lots of territory and setting up these latrine sites where they just use over and over again as a way to, to mark territory and communicate to other otters that might be coming. Uh, Mike repeated his study in 2018, and in that 10-year span, he found that they basically have occupied every waterway on the North Shore, had jumped fully into the Peconic system, and although he had one maybe sighting in the, in the Connecticut River on the South Shore in 2008, no sightings on the South Shore in 2018. But since then, they've come down, and it's, they've come down interestingly from this is, these are the headwaters of the Nisiquag River, and the headwaters of the Connecticut River are really not that far apart from each other, and otters can easily move over land, and his theory is that since this is the first, really the first confirmed sites now on the South Shore, that they've come down from the Nisiquag system. Um, but we have new otters also um, in, the Car in the Carmen's River and in, um, coming out of Mauritius Bay, and, Little Sea Tuck Creek, a really nicely named waterway. So here's a video that um, 
some people up on the North Shore filmed from their deck in the backyard. You just get a sense of how playful they are and active, fighting over this log for a while. Most of my studies have been, again, these latrine sites and, and more recently camera traps because they're, they're hard to find. They're really, they're, they're not that active during the daytime. This is, this is unusual footage to get really good, you know, this is only a part of the video that this couple sent us. And I, I, I promised them when they sent it, they asked me not to play the audio with it because it was them guessing about what these things were and it was, it was very, I found it very entertaining and I would love to share it, but I did promise that I wouldn't do that. But, um, so this is the current map and Mike's, you can see them down. We're sort of ongoing with this. Um, this is, Mike's had this report, 2018. This is the line that he closes the report with. Um, everybody wants to know how many otters we have and he can only say how many latrine sites we have and then they don't really correlate that well. They cover so much ground. but. The otter populations are coming back. It's exciting that they're on the south shore, um, but also problematic for this one reason is that we have a lot of dams associated with roads. And so the otters come up, this is this is a little Seatuck Creek in uh, Eastport. They come up from the tidal section, they hit the, this is where, the, this is the dam, and they can't, they're not climbers, so a wall two or three, you know, two feet they could probably do, three or four feet high, they can't climb over that. So they're, they're stuck, they come back down, they find somewhere they can get out and they walk over and they cross the road and inevitably they get hit by cars. There's a lot of otter uh, roadkill. So that's a problem on the South Shore as they start expanding. If you, you think about Montauk Highway, drive Montauk Highway, like there's, dam there's, there's creeks and streams impounded with dams right at Montauk Highway and the otters are gonna have a lot of problems there. So one of the things that we're working on and this is the first one at that site that we did in Eastport. Is just this is this is a prototype otter stairs with we just made out of some available cinder blocks. Um, but we're looking into some designs with ramps and, and ways to get the otters over the dams without having to go back and cross the roads. So we installed this last year about this time. We put a camera on the top of the steps, and the and like the next day, I asked Mike. I said. Are the otters going to use this thing? Because it doesn't. It's not. The steps aren't even. You know, it's not ADA compliant. And it's, it's complicated. He, Mike said, not. A, they're not only going to use it. They're going to love it because they're playful. They love to just anything to explore. So, here's a quick video of the otters. One of them was right away up and down. The other one was not so sure about those steps. So, started down, backed up again. It's really for them to go up, not down, but they they had some fun with it. I think the other one comes back to, you know, what happened? But you see how like, they're just like constantly moving. Like, they're fun, fun to watch. So anyway, the point of getting this, this community science piece, we do a lot of this as ways to engage people. So we have this auto watch program um, it's a way to just engage people. Mike does this really great training, teaches people how to, how to, how to find the latrines and what to look for. Uh, there's gonna be a lot of this needed on the South Shore. He engaged like 60 people on that 10 year study on the North Shore, but now they're gonna start colonizing on the South Shore and uh, we could use the help. So um, there's a great training video from our website, from the top navigation, there's a get involved tab and then under get involved, see all the opportunities for community science, including Otter Watch. And this is gonna be true about all, this, all the things I'm gonna talk about. So uh, we also just published, Mike did this in January, this Otter Survey Manual, which has everything you wanna know about scat and scrapes and tracks. And it's, it's incredibly detailed. I mean, it's, if there's otter, otter signs to be found and you've read this manual, you're gonna find it. Um, two other species, I'm not going to spend time on these, but these are two other species uh, have been returning to Long Island. They're not, uh, the eagles were extirpated, completely gone. Ospreys, not completely, but really both species wiped out by DDT. This is the 
chemical that was sprayed on the marshes and everywhere in neighborhoods. If you're old enough, I've heard stories about how they used to drive the fogger trucks through the neighborhoods and kids would ride their bikes behind them because it was cool. And, um, I guess it worked well to kill mosquitoes, but it was problematic for lots of things, including ospreys. So, um, uh, Rachel Carson wrote about this problem, but a bunch of scientists on, on just the only thing I'm gonna say about this, but on Long Island helped piece together this problem of what DDT, how it was impacting birds. So uh, Dennis Peelston, uh, Art Cooley, and Charlie Worcester, uh, these three guys, uh, scientists, teachers, um, they, they helped piece together the story that the, D, the DDT somehow impacted the ability of the, of the birds to um, put, ca you know, put calcium into the eggs. So the eggs got weak. So when they laid their eggs, they seemed fine until they tried to incubate them and sat on them and they crushed them. And that's why the population rates were dropping because the breeding success was so bad because they were crushing their own eggs. Um, so when they pieced that together, they led this effort to, uh, they brought a lawsuit, which was sort of a novel thing at the time, a lawsuit on behalf of the environment. And they were successful in, in, in getting DDT banned in Suffolk County. And that led eventually to uh, a national ban and they formed an organization called the Environmental Defense Fund, now one of the world's largest uh, environmental organizations and most effective started right here on Long Island. Osprey, by the way, 10 years ago, there was an osprey nest on Shelter Island. Now there's, I think, 12, we had 12 nesting pairs last year. So they're not, I'm sorry, not osprey, eagles. The eagles are coming back uh, in, in abundance. And there is an effort we're gonna, we haven't launched it yet, but we are gonna involve with the, uh, the group for the East End trying to actually map and count all of the osprey nests on Long Island, which if you, if you drive around, like, they seem like they're everywhere, right? They're just incredible numbers. And it seems like there's so many, but we don't know the density. Like, you know, Long Island was a, was a global stronghold for osprey. So it's hard to know what the, what the baseline was, like how many ospreys were here. So it still seems like it's growing. All right, so the next species is a coyote. Have you heard that there's coyotes on Long Island? I know some of you, I know some of you. So this is not, these are not returning species. These are, these are colonizing. They're naturally expanding their range to include Long Island. Historically, um, we know like wily coyote was in like, in like deserts, in the, they, which they were, but they weren't just in the, those deserts. They were also in the Great Plains. This was a really a, a comprehensive study done a couple years ago that showed that they were really all throughout the West. But if you notice, um, it's the, it's the green is forest cover. So they were really in places where there weren't forests because they, they, they were really more open, open space hunters and the, the, their predators were in the forest, the, the, the bigger predators, the bigger carnivores that they, they were trying to avoid. So there were never coyotes on the eastern part of the United States because these guys were dominating in the forest on the east and, and bears as well. So two things happened. Um, we we wipe we wiped these guys out. We basically took them off the map, and we started cutting all the trees. So naturally, the coyotes just found themselves with room to roam, no predators, and they started roaming. So they started moving west naturally, and you can see this sort of. There's two main directions they came across the southwest. They were. In, you know, into Florida pretty early and then started moving up the coast. And then they started, then they went over the Great Lakes, a separate population went up and over the, the lakes and came, started coming down the East Coast. Uh, that population encountered some of the remnant wolf populations. Uh, and there was, you know, there was very few wolves left. They were trying to breed, so they were you know, crossbreeding with coyotes. So what's happened now with the coyotes that are coming down from Canada and the Great Lakes, uh, they have lots of um, wolf DNA, as much as 25% in some cases. So scientists are starting to see some changes in behavior. Coyotes are really lone creatures, where wolves are really social animals, and they're, they're starting to see more social behavior from coyotes in some cases. So 
if you zoom in here on this map, I don't know if you can be able to tell on this, but the only place that's not colored, and this is going back um, six or seven years, this, this paper, is Long Island. It's gray. It's the only place they're not, they're not, um, they haven't colonized. So it's really no mystery as to why. Well, part of it is, is just the timing. The two populations were sort of converging on the mid-Atlantic. But the other reason is this barrier of, of development and, and cities and, and very little green space for them to hunt. So they eventually found their way into Westchester and so they came down into the Bronx. They've been in Central Park for years. Um, and there was the first coyotes that were living on Long Island were in 2009 first successful actual pair that was net that had a den here was 2016. Uh, unfortunately they picked a really lousy spot and, uh, on the on the some open space and some ball fields on the where the bridge to Rikers Island is near LaGuardia Airport. Busy place but they were there for almost two years almost nobody knew it about it except some, some coyote people. Um, they didn't bother anybody they you know they they've really good about just being sort of nocturnal, staying out of the way, keeping to themselves, until there was some clearing of some of the habitat they were in. They had, they had, they had pups, they had to move the den, they were sort of discovered, people started putting food out for them um, because they thought they were helping and they needed help. And eventually the, uh, the Port Authority got rid of, you know, just decided it was going to, it was a problem that their that this, uh, employees were at risk because parking lot near where the den was and they, they wiped the whole colony. They, they wiped the whole family out. Um, so that was not a not of a happy ending. But the coyotes keep coming. So that when they're when they're young, they stay with their parents for a while. But by the by the time they're a year old, their first year, their parents are gonna have new young and they're some in some rare cases they stay around and help, but mostly they're ushered off the territory and they have to go find new territory. So there, this sort of there's this transient season that happens in the, in the late winter, and they're just trying to find new places. So you probably heard about some coyote sightings on Long Island recently. Uh, that's because the young are are active and moving around, trying to find their own territory. So they keep coming from Westchester. They they are pro probably coming across I mean, from Westchester and the Bronx and Manhattan, coming across the train trestles and the bridges. But they could also swim. Some of these short swims are very good. If you know, you know, dogs are good swimmers, coyotes are very good swimmers. So they're coming into Queens, Northern Nassau. They're hitting, the, you know, there's sort of these stepping stones of parks. There's uh, Alley Pond, I think. Um, this is Cassetta Park. Um, and then they're, so they're kind of finding some patches. But I think of this as like the, sort of coyote alley like they have to, they get to this they get to alley pond they get to this this stretch north of the lie they have access to these two uh, points up here and then they can get to sort of the gateway of of the rest of the island this is what this, this is what the, the biologists expected would happen if they could if they could run this gauntlet and get through this alley then they're in then they're through and then they're in lots there's lots of open space they would be fine. Um, so what we know happened is um, last year, new coyotes arrived into this area and and paired up and had successful dens. So this is this is a picture of one of the first coyotes that set up shop. That's a trail cam that took that picture, not a person, but it's a, it's a beauty, right? Like that's a beautiful land. Um, and so we had we used to had. Uh, two successful dens we know, um, maybe three. So last summer, 2021 is going to be the year, I think, that would be considered sort of the launch pad of the colonization of Long Island because now this, this, this pair had four pups and we expect that they're going to be, they, they may still be around, but they're going to be moving on. The other pups are going to be moving on. They're going to move east and they're going to move, this is another one of the pups, one of the adults from end last year but once they get it once they sort of run through this alley there's gonna that's it they're gonna they're gonna expand across Long Island 
and the experts say within a decade or so they're going to they're going to be across the aisle. So, and there's going to be you know there's going to be complaints about it, and um, there's you know there, I always tell people like coyotes live everywhere in the United States, every suburban place. There's thousands of coyotes in Chicago. There's there's hundreds of coyotes in Washington D.C. They they're fine. They're they're good neighbors. Um, we know they can keep to themselves. They're going to be mostly active at night. The, the question really is whether we can be good neighbors and whether we can do the things that will make the relationship work, and that is not feeding them uh, intentionally or, or, or unintentionally by leaving you know, food out for pets, garbage, um, and, and then just people just understanding, like they're not, they're not going to attack people. They're, 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 gonna, they're not going to attack your pets unless, you know, your pets are out walking around the woods. I mean, you know, there's some simple common sense steps we need to take to avoid the problems. There's bound, there's bound to be problems. One of the things that we're trying to do is, is train people, again, to watch for the county so we know where they are, so we can engage uh, municipal leaders and the public. And we have some partners doing lots of public talks about them and try to avoid some of the problems. They're eating mostly natural diets, uh, you know, rabbits, and they're omnivores. They eat you know, berries and uh, insects, all sorts of things. They're, they they avoid uh, human development with, when, when they when they can, and settle into natural areas. They establish territory, so there's not going to be hundreds of coyotes in a place. They they pair up, they establish a territory, they defend it. So any new coyotes come in, they move on. And so they're going to space themselves out, and they're going to stick to their territories. So there's lots of great information at our website, some uh, full coyote talks that Mike Patini and some of our other partners have done. I encourage you to watch that. We want people to be informed about coyotes and talking to their family and friends about it and, and helping more Long Islanders you know, understand that this is not a threat. It's, it's natural, uh, and we're going to be fine. Like everybody else in the country is fine with coyotes as neighbors. All right. Any coyote questions? Do you want to, before I move on to fish? No? That's good. Um, diadromous fish. This is, these are species that are that are here. They've always been here, but they're we're, I like to think that they're recovering on Long Island, but I'm not totally convinced yet. But we're, we're trying to help them recover. Um, so there's two, two species, but I'm going to start with the definition of diadromous, in case you don't know what this means. Uh, it's a Greek word. The root means running, and the prefix is through. So these are fish that run through uh, from freshwater to saltwater. They split their life cycle between salt and freshwater, which might not sound like a big deal. Until you realize like it's less than one percent of the fish in the world can do this most fish if they live in the ocean you put them in the freshwater pond they die and vice versa they're different chemistries and they're just not they're designed for one or the other in most cases so these fish are really amazing in that sense um, there's so two categories of diadromy first is anadromous so this is the same root with different prefix so these are uprunning fish fish that spend most of their lives in the ocean and swim upstream into freshwater to spawn. You all know the most famous anadromous fish. You've seen it on the Discovery Channel, jumping up waterfalls over grizzly bears, Pacific salmon. This life cycle I think people are familiar with. They live in the ocean, they swim upstream, it's amazing, sometimes hundreds and thousands of miles to lay eggs and spawn. We don't have any salmon on Long Island. Um, we, there were Atlantic salmon, they weren't on Long Island because they require bigger river systems than we, ha we have. But we do have um, alewives, and they're one of the two species actually of river herring that we do have on Long Island. Same life cycle. They spend their adult lives out on the continental shelf in big schools, and then they, they swim into our estuaries in the late winter. They wait for the right time, which is really not a time or a date on the calendar, but a temperature. When the temperature of the 
water coming down the streams is in the high 40s, like around 48 degrees, they swim upstream and they spawn, they, they lay their eggs. Um, they're not nest builders, they do this broadcast spawning. And then unlike some salmon species, they don't die after they spawn, they go back to the ocean. And they can make that trip five or six times throughout their lives. Um, and then they go back, they're out on the continental shelf. And then they, when they're coming in, they're coming in in big groups. There's this term that uh, has been streams when, you know, historically they used to run silver, the rivers and streams, with so many of these fish. And, and their, their cousins, the shad, the American shad, and other shad species would come in and just fill the streams as they were spawning. Um, I have another video here of a site in Mill River. And to give you a sense of how they're their wealth. I'll show you first the video. how silver they are and how they can make a stream look silver. Beautiful, right? So, I don't know if you guys are familiar with the Mill River, but it's the system that runs through Hempstead Lake State Park. I like to think of it as the most poorly treated river on Long Island. Um, because not only was it dammed four or five times for the Brooklyn Waterworks, the uh, failed Brooklyn Waterworks system that became Hempstead Lake State Park, but it was you know, heavily channelized in its lower section. Uh, it, was, it was buried for long stretches. Um, the section in below Smith Pond in Rockville Center, there's a culvert there that's nearly 700 feet. Thick goes under Sunrise Highway, Merrick Road, the Long Island Railroad tracks. And when we first started looking, when the governor's office of storm recovery came and wanted to try to do some restoration, and we talked to some fisheries biologists about the idea of river herring recovery in the Mill River, a lot of them said they don't go that far underground. It's too dark, too far. It's, you know, it's, it's a problem. And we didn't know they were there um, either. That was the other problem. Uh, I'll get to this in a bit, but we have a volunteer river herring survey that happens every year where we, for the past 16 years, have sent people out around the island to look for these fish. So we, even though we've blocked their access to the streams that they need, they still have, they still have some habitat left, it's suboptimal, sometimes it's a little brackish, they can't get to where they want to, but they spawn anyway, so they have some success, not as much as they want, but so their population starts to slide over time. And, but it, does, it hasn't totally disappeared everywhere. So we have these what we call remnant populations of these fish. And, you know, it's, it's, it's not like finding a needle in a haystack, but it's a lot like finding a needle in a haystack because they're hard, to, there's not that many, they're hard to see, um, but we've had some really great volunteers. <laughs> it's, I didn't know she was coming. I didn't tell this, but Diane Wharton is here. Say hi. Diane, is that Diane City? That's not, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I thought in the red sweater here, I thought you were to see the mask is throwing me off. You look like our, one of our star volunteers, I apologize. Diane Wharton, um, she, she lives in South Nassau. She biked around a lot of these streams, including the Mill River, and she found these fish here. And they were on the upstream side of that culvert where nobody expected they would be. That's where, that's where these fish are. So that site is, um, now, the, I'll show you in a minute, the home of the, one of the newest fish passes on Long Island. So these fish now, thanks to this governor's office, the storm recovery project, are gonna have access into Smith Pond and good, good freshwater spawning habitat. So we hope that the run will grow significant. Um, but the problem that these fish have are, are dams. I mean, they can't, they're not like salmon. They can't jump up waterfalls and over grizzly bears. Uh, they're very capable swimmers, but they need to be in a water column swimming. So these dams are permanent barriers. We built these dams uh, to power mills, um, cr uh, harvest cranberries, harvest ice, um, sometimes just, just for recreational purposes or aesthetic purposes. But um, permanent barriers, so I'll get back to the dams in a minute. And we move to the other, the other species of fish. Uh, these are the catadromous down running fish. So these are fish that spend most of their lives in fresh water and migrate to the ocean to spawn. Um, we only have one on Long Island, the American eel. 
I think the most amazing fish in the world. Their story is just incredible. Um, that's that's an that's an adult um, American. Animal. So they they start their lives in the Sargasso Sea, which is this place in the middle of the North Atlantic, and it you know, sounds like a, it's a nice little place, the Sargasso Sea. It's like I forget the numbers. It's It's twice as big as the Mediterranean Sea, this area called the Sargasso, which is not really a, a place. It's more of a, an area in the middle of all these Atlantic currents. It's sort of like the gyre in the middle of all this swirling water. And they all hatch there. Scientists have only figured this out like five years ago. They found where they, they proved that they, they, they hatched there, but they've never seen the adult spawning. They've never found an adult in the Sargasso Sea. They only find the babies, and they first hatch when they're very, very young. That's how they know they're, that's where they're, that's where they're hatching. Uh, it's one of the mysteries of science. Sargasso gets its name, by the way, from this macroalgae, uh, sargassum, and it kind of, that's where it gathers for the same reasons, because it's in the middle of all these currents. So, um, but when they hatch, they're sort of leaf-like, planktonic. They're not swimming, they're drifting in currents, and they drift east and north, and they find their way up along the Atlantic coast, and um, they, this is what they look like. They're totally translucent, and they eventually, when they get over the coast, or they get over the continental shelf, they start to transform into that eel shape, and they start swimming, and they swim into the estuaries and then into the, the rivers and streams. And the vi next video I have is an image of, of them in the stream. They're they're not this leaf-like shape anymore. Now they they look like an eel. They're still translucent, and underwater, they look they all, they're almost white, they almost glow white. So this is, I think, a beautiful 30 seconds of video. It's going to dis dispel any preconceived notions you have about eels being ugly. So be warned. <laughs> Ten months old. They've been floating in the ocean. They've maybe swimming for a, a month or so. They find their way. This is a creek in Bayshore, and they're trying to get upstream. They're going to live there for ten years, twenty years. In bigger systems, they they found them thirty years old in, the, in like the Susquehanna and the, in the Mississippi. Um, and then at some point, they go through this final transformation, and they become they you know they sort of keep growing. They're, they become yellow eels. Most of their adult life is yellow eel, but then they become what's called silver eels eyes get bigger, their fins get bigger, and they, they stop eating, they sort of shut down everything, and they're just swimmers, and they swim out to, back to the Sargasso Sea. And somehow, so, scientists, again, they don't know how this happens, they all find each other, and they, they spawn. It's a mystery, it's still a mystery of science, how it happened. This is back to the Mill River. This is the Mill River site, just to give an idea of how many of these eels, when they come in from the ocean, and can gather, and again, they're 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 stuck at dams. They can I'll show you some video. They can climb a little bit, but they're not easily getting over dams. So this is they're all stuck here because there's a spot where this is all failing this dam, and they're swimming, trying to climb up the bulkheading to get into the pond. Any nice music on this one? That's a lot of eels, right? The amazing thing about these fish, one of the most expensive, or most valuable fish in the seas, because um, eels are obviously a big part of Asian cuisine, and they, uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a European version of this fish, there's a European eel, there's an Asian, there's a couple of Asian species. The Asian species in the European basically been fished out of the sea because of, because of this crazy reproductive system they have where they don't really even know how it happens. 
they can't reproduce it in captivity. So all they can do is catch the babies and then take them to the huge aquaculture facilities and grow them out and then sell them to the restaurants. So there's, there's only one uh, glass eel fishery left in the United States. It's in Maine. It's like two weeks long. It's like $2,000 a pound for these fish. It's not, you know, there's a lot of pressure on the American eel. That's why we say they're recovering. There's efforts to, to, um, to get them you know, back into their habitat they need, past dams, but there's also pressure on them um, from poaching and, uh, and other illegal harvesting. That's, about, that's how big they are. And when they first come in, they were all throughout the eastern United States, all the way up the Mississippi system, all through the Gulf of Mexico, even down in South America. They say that scientists say that they're in. If the, if the American eels are in a river system, they make up more of the biomass than any other single species, and that's what adult size looks like. That's probably a 20, 25. That's an old. That's an old eel. Oh, I don't know. That's probably I don't know five or ten pounds. I guess yeah. And then they would all, they would, the, the adults, the silver eels, would go downstream in the fall. And so, and, and all triggering basically at the same time. And so there were these the Native Americans and their, they used to set up these weirs where they would pile rocks up to put, as they're going downstream, to push them into, a, into, a, into baskets and nets. And just like, they were the easiest thing to harvest. They basically swam into the nets for you. Um, so there's some debate, I always say there's some debate about whether there was, Turkey at the original Thanksgiving, there's no question that there was eel because it was in the fall and it was a, just an abundant, abundant fish. So maybe we should start to have an eel at Thanksgiving. So why should you care? Like, so I got these river herring, you know, foot long. You know, some people do pickle them and eat them, but they're not really a popular fish. They're not a sport fish, and eels sort of the same. The reason is all the things that eat. I mean, they, they're, um, and these are all species that are eating adults, adult eels and adult river herring. Think about all the other things eating these fish, the, the Ameri the Ameri those tiny little American eels coming in, feeding everything. Uh, the adult, every adult river herring that comes into a system can lay a quarter million eggs. Every one of those little tiny packets of, of protein feeding everything in the streams. And it's this, it's the motion, it's the movement of energy from the ocean. Ocean-derived energy moving into the bays and moving into the, up, into the rivers and streams and then being distributed across the uplands is really a critical part of why the whole ecosystem works. That they, they, move that, they move that energy upstream. So really, we say that they help drive the whole coastal ecosystem. Uh, it's, it's no exaggeration. So this, as I mentioned, is the survey happens every year. It's happening now. It runs from March through May. Um, we have you know, 100 people or so out across the island. Um, there's a training online. There's still time if you want to participate in this. Uh, there's lots of places around the island that we now have. We have like 26, I think, rivers and streams where they've been, where these remnant runs have been found. But there's like 140 rivers and streams in just Nassau and Southwark. So uh, there's still places where they probably exist and we haven't found them yet. And even where they do exist, the data that we've tried to collect at their back, when they're back, how many there are, it's an important ongoing uh, study. So if, you're, if you live near a stream, and almost all Long Islanders do, uh, there's a chance to go out and help us. Uh, and we've really, I will say, with these 20-something employees who have figured out all the, the technology. We have this really great app, this app-based system now where you know, we used to collect like paper forms, now everybody just sends it in on the app, it's a piece of cake, and uh, really user-friendly. And this map, with this river revival map, we've mapped every river and stream and have shown where, uh, in green, where they have, where the fish have access, uh, red where they don't, that's usually, the, usually the tidal section is green, accessible, then they hit a dam and they can't get past it. Places in blue, like at Argyle Lake and Babylon there, uh, where fish passes have been put in. So the, finding the fish is the, really the first step. It's the wind in the sails 
that allows us to advance conservation projects. So once we know there's fish in a system, we can work to um, try to try to help them. And so we say reconnect these streams. Uh, this is that hard flake dam in Yapank again, where the first permanent fish ladder on Long Island was installed in 2008. Uh, we're actually running a solar powered fish counting system on this now to try to assess if the run has grown in 12 years. I feel like it should be doing better. We don't know for sure. And this is that Smith Pond site where all those, those eels were all stuck almost exactly where that, where that entrance to the new fishway is. So the river herring are gonna come up. They've gone through all the mess of that river, 700 feet under those roads and railroad tracks. They're gonna get to this spillway where they used to stop. Now they're this year for the very first time we're going to swim up that spillway into that big pond so that's exciting this is a this is a these are what we consider technical uh, fish passes they have baffles in the bottom of them to create eddies for the fish to kind of zigzag their way up uh, this is a nature-like fishway this is like a rock ramp it sort of mimics a natural stream it is engineered in the sense that there's boulders in there that give fish the spots to take a break. Um, but this is in Granville Park on the Conic River. This is this was installed in 2010. And this run has grown. We've, we've been working with the Conic Estuary Partnership to install a camera to monitor the run, and we have seen uh, incremental growth. And there's new fishways installed on the river. The Conic River is close to being fully reconnected with fishways, so that's exciting. We've also, this uh, last year, for the first time, installed a dedicated eel pass. So this is very simple technology with just some some mesh that they can swim. Because they're, they're, they're they literally can climb, very hard for them, but if they have something to hold on to, they're like snakes, if they have two points, they can kind of push their, their way up. So we have just simple PVC tubing with netting inside of it, and they can kind of wiggle their way up there and get it into the lake and go upstream. So those fishways are great, eel passes are great. I've, we've worked on it a lot at SeaTac, but this, this is where we need to get to. This is unfortunately not a scene from Long Island. This is in uh, New Hampshire, I think. Uh, you know, we're not harvesting ice. We're not, there's no cranberry production on Long Island. We don't need water wheels to power mills anymore. We need to get past the, the legacy of dams and uh, let these rivers run again not only for the fish, but all the benefits of having reconnected systems for other turtles and other birds and things that need flowing water. Um, and we actually have a restoration. I started my talk with this slide. I don't know if anybody, anybody recognize this site? So we drive the merge on Sunrise Highway going east there, past Connectbot. It used to be on the south side if you were going East, there was a pond right there as the road squeezed in. Uh, in 2019, the, the, the dam didn't fail, but the board is where the water flowed through. This is called the spillway. The boards broke. A big log and a storm hit one of them, and the parks department tried to fix it. They took some out. By the time they could get it repaired, the whole thing drained. And then they had a problem on their hands because it wasn't going to be a simple fix. And, and then SeaTuck and other organization started clamoring for them just to let it go don't fix it uh, it was a muddy mess at first but this is only the set. this is the one year after the dam broke um, essentially a dam removal and we had uh, the Long Island Botanical Society there and the New York State botanist a guy named Steve Young I tell people it was like having like a bunch of eight-year-olds in the world's greatest candy shop I mean they were like beside themselves with the with the native restoration that happened here no, nothing was done. We didn't plant anything. It was just the seed bank that had been there underwater for 120 years that given the opportunity with water gone, soils dried out a little bit, sunlight, they just, you know, seeds can persist for hundreds and in some cases they say thousands of years. And during those botanical surveys, we had six or eight uh, rare New York plants, including a few that were already the largest po uh, populations on Long Island. So 
it's it's still um, it's still a remarkable natural restoration underway. The problem is though is that first of all, Parks has not decided yet what they're doing. They're still studying the the issue three years on, and we feel like that's a good. The longer they take to study it, the longer it's going to you know the chances are better it's going to stay. Um, the cost of repairing it is starting to mount. The dam it's old. You know they start looking at the it's not just putting the boards in. I got to fix the things that hold the boards, and then the concrete and the earthen structure starts to sound like millions of dollars. So that's good. There are groups pushing parks to repair it, but I think I think we're close to being in the clear. But Phragmites is on this was historically on the edges of the pond. You know the common reed, the big plant that's taken over lots of places. Um, we've been fight. We were there with volunteers six times last year, just stopping the encroachment so anywhere it was moving in from the edges into the basin we've been pulling it out we got a grant from the long island invasive species species management agency uh, to do some more serious removal to try to protect it from phragmites but we're back this this week for earth day if you want to join us in a frag fight we'll be there on, on friday morning um, from nine to twelve and it's it's rewarding work to pull Phragmites when you know that there's this, all these other great plants that you're, you're protecting in this natural community that's, that's growing there. So um, there's details about where to park on our website and how to, how to get involved. All right, it's quarter to, yeah, it's quarter to eight, 15 minutes. I had a couple other species. So you want to, should I keep going? You want to stop for question, with questions? Any questions about the fish? Before we move off that. Yeah, not not that, I, that you know that the pond where the dam is is upstream of the spill, and it, even though the tide does push up there, it doesn't seem like a lot got got carried up through the culverts and things. So it's it, there's no. They said there was smell for a couple days. I didn't smell it. I was there like four days later. You know, it's never great to have oil into into a river, but like I said, the Mill River, these are these are tough fish. I mean, it's like you know, you want to feel optimistic about the future. Like river herring are a species to root to root for because they've put up with a lot. They're holding on. I think they're going to be fine. With that. I mean, it might have other impacts, but at least, at least for them. If it had happened a month later and happened now, it might have been more of a problem. They weren't in yet. It was it was still early. So. Yeah. So, in general, are there any concerns about these returning uh, species? It's like one species returning, but a different species that kept them in check originally has not yet returned. Any problems like that? Yeah, well, it's, uh, yeah, there, I mean, there's a niche, right? There's a niche there. So, the, you know, coyote, uh, wolves are not coming back. Mountain lions are not coming back to this part of the, of the Northeast, at least. Um, um, there might be other places where it's in theory in the Adirondacks could see wolves someday, but it's unlikely we're going to have those predators back at their historic numbers. So the coyotes are filling a niche that they were, it's there. And it's really, it seems like there's, it's mostly going to be beneficial because without the, without those top, those apex predators, we call them around, a lot of things are out of whack. Um, you know, deer are a great example. The deer herds are just, causing problems you know, in Pennsylvania, all throughout New England, on Long Island now that they're taking, you know, they're spanning across Long Island. Um, you know, everybody loves to see deer. They're beautiful, but they just, you know, they're like, I would say they're like those, um, um, those vacuum cleaners that just go through around your house and never stop, and they just keep picking things up. That's what the deer herd is, just constantly eating everything in the forest. And it's a problem because we need things to be growing in the forest. It's, you know, trees, they love young tree saplings and they mow them down. Um, there's certain, you know, some invasive species they don't eat. But the problem with for the forest is that if you don't have any young trees growing, it might not seem like a problem now because you have lots of big trees there. 
but eventually those big trees are going to age out and fall. And generally, when a tree falls in the forest, there's lots of saplings waiting for the light. They get the light, then they shoot up, they claim that space, so you get new trees growing. If there's no saplings there, then you just have an opening in the forest that doesn't get filled, and it's bad news for forests. So uh, it's one example. There's some, there's some hope that the coyotes, there's, there's really no evidence yet that the coyotes will control the deer herds, um, but there's some hope on Long Island where an iso because the deer are isolated and the habitat's isolated, that the coyotes will have some impact on the young, on the young, uh, young deer. So anyway, I just generally I think you know, they're filling a niche that needs to be filled. So yeah, keep going. All right, turtles. Well, turtle anyway. This is the diamondback terrapin. Again, some questions about whether efforts that have been made recently are gonna help this species recover. Um, this is the world's only brackish turtle. So it's not really a sea turtle. It lives on the edge of the ocean in the estuaries. Um, it can tolerate full salt water. It can tolerate fresh water. Amazing species. My colleague John likes to call it the, the turtle with the clown lips, has these really big powerful lips for eating uh, mollusks and crustaceans and lots of other things. Uh, they're pretty easy to see in the summer if you're out and about in the bays, you know, they, if you're quiet you can see they're, they're just sticking their heads up and breathing and sunning a little bit. Um, sometimes in the marshes you can find a couple of them gathered off, off the side. The males almost rarely leave the water. They're in the water all the time. The females do get out to lay eggs uh, and climb onto sandy beaches and lay eggs. Which is a problem, of course, because we've put lots of roads in the way of the places they want to lay eggs. So uh, this is something that we've been working on. Uh, we actually just, uh, last week, we were out at Orient Beach State Park, where if you know Orient Beach, the very end of the North Fork, it's really, if you haven't seen it, it's a spectacular place to visit, but there's a road right down the middle of the spit where the turtles like to lay eggs. So they have a constant problem in the summertime during June when they're nesting with roadkill. So we've worked on this solution to uh, temporarily install these, this corrugated pipe, 4,000 feet of it last week, and the turtles can't get over it. It gets, it gets held down with some metal brackets, and uh, they, they can't get past it, so they can't get to the road, so they can't get run over. And then we've, in places where it's, it works, we're creating turtle gardens, so they have room to nest on the, on the good side of the piping. So this is, well, this is John Turner here in the foreground, the, the island's greatest turtle, ad, the terrapin advocate. Well, he seems like he's mostly watching. I gotta, I gotta have to point that out. No, he's, he's holding a hammer. I don't know. If that... And then the other problem they have is they're, they're omnivores, and they, they forage, and they're seeking food, and they're smelling things, so they're smelling um, baits. People put bunker or dead things in their crab traps. Uh, the terrapins are, like, sweet, free meal. They go in, they eat the, eat the baits then they can't get out because those the way the traps are designed so um, really just they become killing and they're you know they're they're air breathers they can take some oxygen but they have to get back to the surface so they eventually just drown in the crab ponds which is really this terrible pictures with you know, dozens of them sometimes stuck in these traps because then they they die then they become bait for other terrapins that just come find them so a pretty simple fix is a, ter a TED, a terrapin excluder device, which is a simple plastic piece that goes on the entranceway. It's designed to be the right size for blue crabs to fit through, but the terrapins can't get in, and uh, they, get, uh, they get turned around, and they go back to the, they don't, get the they don't get the free meal, but they also get to live because they get to go back to the service degree. So we've worked with the Nature Conservancy uh, we first pushed the state to pass a law to require TEDs on all, on all commercial and um, recreational crab traps within a certain uh, distance of the shore. So not out in the middle of the bays, because the, the terrapins are really, they're coastal, they're right on the edges. So any, any 
crab traps in those areas are supposed to have these excluder devices on them. Uh, we got some pushback from the baymen, so because they, you know, the cost of each trap has four entrances. I got four excluders, even the, you know, they're a dollar or two apiece, but you have lots and lots of traps that add it up. So SeaTuck and the Nature Conservancy footed the bill for tens of thousands of these things and gave them to the DEC to distribute to crabbers across Long Island. So we think we've had pretty good buy-in and hopefully lots of turtles are being kept out of uh, traps and not done. But still, there's still not a lot known about terrapin. See, we know we're, we know uh, Hofstra's uh, Russ Burke is, is a great turtle expert and been studying them at Jamaica Bay. We know a lot about the population there. But a lot of other places, we don't know where they nest and where, they're, where their strongest uh, populations are. So this is another volunteer effort we have underway called Terrapin Watch. And this is really pretty much, if you see them, let us know. It's a great, simple app. It talks you through a series of questions. Um, there's, a, there's a training video on our website for this as well. So if you want to help us find Terrapins, we do map this. We don't, we don't put the public data about like where the eels are, for example, because they're so, they're so valuable. But the, the terrapins, we do. People like to see their their reports show up on a map, so it works well. Turtle questions. Is there still any kind of commercial terrapin harvesting going on? No, in that's New York? All, no. That was actually the first thing that was done was an effort. They were being harvested, well, commercially, or just people harvesting them to eat them. You know, turtle soup, the famous sort of turtle soup was this was the turtle, or maybe one of the turtles, but it was really, they were a lot of people catching turtles historically in and around New York City to make soup. That was, that was also shut down. So between the no, no direct harvesting, excluders not getting caught in the crab traps and the effort to try to keep them off roadways we're hoping that there's going to be some terrapin recovery yes our question is when did the uh, excluder law get implemented right yeah yeah do you want me to ask it again yeah um, when did the uh, excluders get implemented, and are you seeing any results now? Yeah, it's pretty new. So that's just the, I think the law is, uh, went into effect uh, two summers ago. Okay. So it's, we've been distributing the TEDs, and yeah, it's still too early to tell it. Okay. So that was sort of the, you know, the kind of the encouraging side of the ledger. I just want to, you know, just, there is still lots of problems lots of species struggling, uh, declining, and other species that have been lost to Long Island that I'm not going to go into. But just, I have, I'll do this quickly. Just, um, you might mention, you, know, you mentioned the turns, you know, heard the turns earlier. This is a common turn. Um, this is a site, this is a, like a three acre island on the, in the middle of the Great South Bay. You heard earlier. birds are they're colonial nesters so they nest in, in with each other in you know, sort of protection in colonies large colonies at times um, they used to nest on on the beaches and there was lots of great nesting habitat along island all of the south shore was full I mean if that seems like a lot that's probably it's probably 200 or 300 pairs so 500 birds you know, there were hundreds of thousands of these birds and this is only one species there's several species of terns and other colonial nesters and other species that nest on beaches the problem is that these birds lay their eggs and nest in, in june and july which is not a great time uh, if you're competing with people on beaches so we basically push them off all of the ocean beaches except nickerson beach where the town of Hempstead is protecting some habitat for them which it's still the largest nesting colony on Long Island now um, because, it, because they're working so hard to safeguard it. 
basically, we so we pushed them off the ocean beaches. We pushed them into the bays, the bay beaches, and onto these marsh islands, which is basically the only place other than Nickerson that common terns are nesting on the South Shore or on marsh islands. Um, but this is the problem with the marsh islands. That's a, I mean, that's a nesting site there. That's the that's the water, and they're they're really at risk these birds. So this island, two or three acres in the middle of the Great South Bay is the largest common tern colony, not including Nickerson Beach, on the entire South Shore. Um, and, you know, we're getting a foot of sea level rise. So it's like, that's that's already, we could all go buy Teslas tomorrow. I mean, it's it's, it's already cooked in. These birds have no, this, this site has about a, maybe has a foot of elevation, but they, this site is no longer gonna be a tern colony because it's gonna be underwater. There's already, anecdotal stories of terns at other sites, uh, eggs getting submerged and, and drowned and chicks drowning during storm events and just regular uh, regular high tides in some cases. That's, that's gonna happen at the grout. So um, the grout is not, the grout is so small, it's not even on this map. It's sort of in the middle of that open space there. All these other islands have terns on them. That's what one foot of sea level rise looks like. I mean, there's, they're basically all underwater. So we're, we, we launched a new pro program called the South Shore Return Project, we're trying to bring, you know, so the common terns are here. Some species are already gone, rosia terns, at least there's some least terns hanging on, but we're trying to get these birds to higher ground so they can nest and, and you know, have a chance for the next several decades. And it's somewhat ironic, but the places that they're gonna have a chance on that we're trying to move them to are the, are the dredge spoil islands. So the, you know, when dredging was done, they dredged the old boat channels in the, in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. They were just dumping the spoils onto marshes, which was destroying lots of marshes, and lots of people complained over the years of all the marsh habitat that was lost to dredge spoils. But now, these dredge spoil islands, which are 10, 20 feet high in some cases, are perhaps, we hope, a refuge and a chance move these birds. So um, to, uh, Thursday, we're going to be out setting up equipment, decoys, recording equipment, recording those calls, or playing those calls, and trying to get turns to move from the grouts a mile and a half to a dredge spoil island where they'll, where they'll be 15 feet off the water. And uh, it's not, it's not, we we're not inventing the wheel. This has been successfully done in other places. They've even built artificial islands to move them in some cases. So we hope that they'll, over time, take to some of these other spots. We can get them to higher ground and they'll be saved. Last thing is vernal pools. You guys know what a vernal pool is? The most amazing habitat. Uh, the thing about vernal pools is they dry up. They're, they're temporary by nature. They're called vernal pools in the Northeast because they mostly hold, hold water or the most water in the spring because of all the snow melt and rain. Um, but the, because they dry up either seasonally or, or at some point over the course of a year or two, they don't hold fish. There's no fish populations. So you basically remove, vernacles don't have the biggest uh, predators, the things that are eating everything. So a whole category of wildlife have evolved to breed in these pools and live in these pools because there's no fish and they, they're land-based critters that go into the pools, lay their eggs, and then the young, young hatch, and then transform to land critters that move out of the pools and spend their lives. So there's a couple of examples. I'm just gonna show you a video of one of my favorites, because I, I, didn't, I didn't know these, these things even existed 10 years ago, but we've been working on spotted salamanders. Spotted salamanders, they live, they're fossorial. They're one of the, there's, there's several, um, uh, these, these underground, not underground, under the leaf litter salamanders. They, um, they spend the whole year underground, eating lots of you know, worms and other critters. Then they, in March here at least now, when it's raining and it's like over 45 degrees or so, so they get triggered to go into the pools and they, they breed and then they go back to the, back to the leaf litter. So this is video from Nassau County of some 
what's called this overland migration of the, the uh, spotted salamanders moving to the moving to the ponds. And they're not like little salamanders; they're like they're like eight or nine inches long, but big. You're hearing spring peepers. been mapping vernal pools lot so lots of vernal pools have been lost on Long Island because wetlands wetland laws when they were passed in 1972 there was a big compromise between the, the farming industry upstate um, and they, they set the, the sort of jurisdictional limit at five hectares which is like 12.4 acres which below which DEC had no jurisdiction so 12 acres a big pond for Long Island Maybe not upstate, but anything under 12.4 acres, DC had no jurisdiction. It could be filled, fill it with sand, fill it with rocks, do whatever you wanted. Unless it was deemed a wetland of, of local significance, which a, lot, which a lot of them were. There was um, you know, endangered, state endangered tiger salamanders out east where they did identify the important habitats, but lots of other ponds got filled. But we were trying to map all the remaining vernal pools along Long Island figure out which ones are the most ecologically important, get them, in, try to get them in public ownership, try to make sure they're being managed pursuant to some best management practices, uh, ensure that the habitat around them is protected because most of the critters in the vernal pools rely on the forest around them as well. And this is another, we have a great working group with lots of uh, partners and we're, you know, mapping best practices and then advocating to protect these sites. And we could use help with this project too. It's a great get people involved in just finding, you know, finding them and then confirming that there's breeding happening in them. So yeah, that's all I have. That's my, uh, that's our team again. This is, if you want any interest in any of these things, you just want to, just staff at ctuck.org, uh, it comes to my inbox. I'll send it to any, whichever one of these people uh, is the right one, and uh, you'll be, you'll be uh, welcomed with open arms. Questions or you? you want to yeah, that uh, the, the mill pond, the, the Wonton Mill Pond, that's Belmore Creek. Yes. So the, the woman that I thought was with us today, that's not, um, she, that found the Mill River. Remnant run of river herring also found fish at Belmore at the dam at Belmore Creek, and they're not those they're not connected waterways. They're totally. No, those are all those are all impoundments. They're 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 dammed streams. Yeah. Yeah. So the, yeah, I and mean, most there's very few natural ponds on Long Island. They're it, you know they're they're. They're formed by they're remnants of the glaciers, uh, kettle hole ponds, right? Uh, Lake Ronkonkoma, uh, there's lots of little kettle hole ponds out east. A lot of the vernal pools are also, they form these little depressions on the landscape. But most of the ponds we know, especially on the south shore, um, are impounded streams, dammed up streams. sections of these 
streams that once flowed unimpeded to the bays. Can you come up to the mic, please? Um, if you think that you see one of these depressions and you think it may be an old stream that was dammed up, where can you go to find any kind of surveys or maps uh, from way back that may give you some information on what was running through? I, see, I have a, a ditch in my property, and I don't know if at one time, 150, 200 years ago, it could have been a pond that was dammed up or a stream that was dammed up. Where can I go to find information on this? Yeah, um, I would say call, call us in this. Uh, this woman, Emily, has done that. We did this in Belmore. She traced all the history of Belmore Creek and why all the dams were built. And um, we, you know, we have mapped all the rivers and streams, so we have probably a pretty good idea of uh, if, if it's on one of our uh, systems that we've already mapped. I, that we think we've got them all, so we'll probably have some information for you. But the vernal pools, just Thank to be clear, you. the vernal pools are not connected. They're they're isolated by nature. There's no input to a vernal pool and no, no, no outflow from a vernal pool. They, they collect water from a small area and they hold it for a while until it dries up. Anything else? Yeah. I should also say about, I mentioned the turn work we're doing. Um, I, didn't, I didn't say, almost everything we're doing has some opportunity for volunteer volunteers. So we, if you're interested in, in birds and want to come, I mean, we're, we're going to be doing a lot of watching of these colonies this summer, just at least twice a week. And we're going to open, we have a small boat, but we're going to open that up to volunteers who want to come along. So that's Ariel's project want to reach out to ctuck.org and say you want to come on the boat and watch the Terran colonies with us. Um, oh, oh. Um, related to the last person's question, um, so if there are like a lot of developments where vernal pools used to be, would you say that there's like a lot of rates of like flooding of those areas? Yeah, probably because they exist in a natural depression. That's why there was a vernal pool there. And if it was was filled and built on, I mean, it probably could still have some, I mean, could still have some water problems, I'm guessing yeah. that would be true, yeah. I'm I mean, guessing it's probably like really swampy there, too. That's what? I'm, I'm guessing it's probably really swampy there, too. Uh, yeah, they, in many cases, they don't dry up completely. They dry up in the sense that there's no water column for fish to live in, but they're still muddy and, and you know, yeah, it's a problem for people to try to make their yards in them. Yeah, a lot of vernal pools are depressions that are just kind of at the level of the water table. And if, you know, if it doesn't rain for a couple of weeks or a month or so, you know, the water table will drop and the pool dries up. But if you get a, a rainy period, the water table rises again and, the, you know, the depression will flood. So I think you're right. There. So. All right, well, let's uh, thank our speaker one more time. Yes, thanks.